If you've been watching our channel for any length of time, you'll know I'm a huge fan of RPGs, particularly ones from the mid 2000s and early 2010s. The Mass Effect trilogy, Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2, the Fable trilogy, Oblivion, and Skyrim. Since we are getting perilously close to the release of the Amazon Fallout TV show, there has never been a better time to talk about the Fallout games, and in particular today's topic, Fallout 3. Now, I know amongst you post-apocalyptic gamers that New Vegas is the cream of the crop when it comes to this particular brand, but as much as I like New Vegas, I've never been able to get into it the same way I was able to get into Fallout 3. I love the madcap NPCs, the dingy feeling of the world, the sheer brutality of the enemies, and how much freedom there is on display for such a dour setting. So with that out of the way, I'm Craig, this is Amalgam Mingle, and here are my picks for the top 5 best quests in Fallout 3. Quick disclaimer before we start, this list is made up of base game quests so nothing from any of the great DLCs are in here and I'm also not including any main quests either. Let's move on to our first entry. So I can study its effects. Oh not a deadly dose of course. I can fix you up before that. Starting off our list is one of two quests you can easily pick up the first time you reach Megaton when you leave Vault 101 for the first time and that's the Wasteland Survival Guide. To get this quest you only have to go to the crater side supply shop. Once you go inside, you'll trigger dialogue with Moira Brown, the oddball proprietor of said establishment. Craterside Supply is a place you go anyway, as she's the only merchant in Megaton who sells weapons, ammo and armour. She'll instantly know you're not from around here and that you're from the vault. And it won't take long for you to notice she's a little... eccentric? But she has a job for you if you're interested. She basically blurts it out at you anyway. Moira wants to do a book on the wasteland. She wants to help people survive out in the wastes and thinks this book will help. And you're going to be her assistant slash guinea pig. What makes this quest so great is all the different locations Moira will send you across the capital wasteland. You'll visit robot factories, a sewer that's a breeding ground for Myalurks and even go to a library. But that's just the locations. What you also do varies, such as getting yourself irradiated and damaging your limbs, playing whack-a-mole rat and many other fun things that make this quest stand out. And then there's another reason why this quest quest is so great, and that's player choice. The eponymous Wasteland Survival Guide has three chapters, and each chapter is broken up into two different objectives, and each objective have optional extras, and depending on whether or not you do these optional extras is what really makes this so fun. If you complete this quest with all optional extras complete, then Free Dog, the Wasteland's one and only disc jockey, will sing the book's praises and tell everyone to go out and get it, and if you don't do any of them, then he'll condemn the book as a piece of shit and that it's not worth the paper it's printed on. And of course, there's also just the amount of silliness you get from talking to Myra. Just remember, if you do go all the way in, it's for a good cause. Real wasteland survival guru. Next up on our list is probably the quest that will give you the biggest what the hell moment when wandering the wastes. At the far eastern side of the map you'll find a little hamlet called Canterbury Commons. Any wandering merchants and their brahmin that you see all come from here. But there's something more interesting to see when you first come to the centre of the town. And I'll let the scene speak for itself. That's right, as if mutated bears, moles, flies and death claws aren't enough, there are also two costumed kooks running around this tiny little town making life even more miserable for the denizens of Canterbury Commons. One of them is a woman who controls giant ants called the Ant Agonizer, and the other is a man who controls robots called the Mechanist. I love this game. After the little battle we've just seen takes place, with the Mechanist always winning, the two of them retreat to their respective lairs, and that's when you can talk to Uncle Ro, the mayor of sorts of Canterbury Commons. He goes into a little bit more detail. Basically, the Ant Agonizer is a supervillain and the Mechanist is a superhero. Or that's how they paint themselves. And it's here that Uncle Ro will give you the quest the Superhuman Gambit. He wants them gone, and he doesn't really care how you do it. Stop either one of them, or even both, and he will pay you for your troubles. 
Once again, choice is what makes this quest so great and memorable. You can attack one or the other, or you can kill them both. Or you can side with one of them and attack the other. This option alone is brilliant. Storming the ant agonizer's lair with a posse of robots at your side is awesome. You can persuade them both to stop their stupid fight, or you can even stop the fight before it begins when you first arrive in town. I know I'm skipping over a lot in this quest, but if you haven't played this quest, you really should experience all the madcap silliness for yourself. Cleaning up the town. Middle entry, and we return to Megaton for what is probably the most well-known evil thing you can do in Fallout 3. If you don't know why Megaton got his name, you'll soon see why once you get inside and look down the main straight. Down at the bottom of the main street stands an unexploded nuclear bomb sitting in a puddle of irradiated water. Oh, and it's also surrounded by an utterly silly cult called the Children of the Atom, who worship the bomb and you'll hear their sermons whenever you go and past during the day. And this cult was made scarier in Fallout 4, but we're not here for the children. We're here for the bomb itself. When you first arrive in Megaton, you'll be approached by Luke Sims, the mayor and sheriff of the town. After talking to him about your reason for being here, you can ask him about the bomb. And regardless of your explosive skills, you can offer to disarm the bomb for him. To do this, you'll need a minimum explosive skill of 25 to disarm the bomb. If you disarm the bomb for Sims, not only will you get a load of positive karma, but you'll also be awarded a player home right here in Megaton, complete with your own robot butler. But what if you're feeling a little naughty? What if you don't like Sims? What if Moira annoys you? Or you think Colin Moriarty is a dick who should bite down on a frag grenade? Well, let me introduce you to Mr. Burke, dear viewer. One of the more refined NPCs you'll find in the Capital Wasteland, Mr. Burke can be found in Moriarty's saloon, sat in one of the corners. Once you get close enough, he will talk to you. And he doesn't waste much time in telling you why he's there. He's there at the behest of his employer, Alistair Tempenner, to detonate the bomb because he considers the town to be a blight on the landscape. Agree to help Burke, and he'll give you a fusion pulse charge to the bomb to explode. Once you do that, you head over to Tenpenny Tower, a place you can see from Megaton on the horizon, get to the tower, head up to the top, and you'll finally get to speak to this Alice the Tenpenny for yourself. And his loyal subordinate, Mr. Burke, is also there. And lying on the ledge is the detonator for the bomb. After a little small talk, Mr. Burke gives you the honours of detonating the bomb. And boy is it spectacular, seeing the town blow up in a mushroom cloud, killing everyone in the town. Well, almost everyone. Hey! Is that you? Oh, my head's still ringing from that explosion. What happened? But that's just the binary options for the quest. You can agree to help Burke, but turn over the fusion device to Sims, who will try to arrest him. And if you're not quick enough, Burke will one-shot kill Sims. This can be a shame, as I like him, but he also has an awesome outfit that can't be found anywhere else in the game. Or if you choose to disarm the bomb and you didn't even speak to Burke, he'll send Talon Company mercenaries after you. And killing Burke will also mean the Talon mercs will come after you. So be on your guard because they travel in packs of three and have really good armor and weapons. Or if you want to do this solely for the money, then be careful who you side with. Sims maxes out at 500 caps, but Burke can pay up to 1,000 caps if you play your cards right. Just ask yourself, is it worth it? I must be getting slow in my old age. Thanks for saving my height. For our penultimate entry, we're heading up north from Megaton to a tiny little shack that is hidden away behind some rocks for a nice homely little quest. This is Agatha's house, an elderly woman who lives alone and plays music through her late husband's radio gear. She doesn't have the mass reach of Galaxy News Radio or the Enclave, but it's a nice alternative. Go into her house and you can speak to her. Despite her solitary existence, she's a nice old lady and she only wants one thing, a Stradivarius violin that once belonged to a long dead relative. Thus begins Agatha's song. At first, you might think this will be a pain trying to locate it, but you're only half right. Agatha is sure she knows where the fancy fiddle is located, but she doesn't know where. Well, she does, but she doesn't. It's in Vault 92, a vault that was meant to house the best musical minds of the nuclear age to preserve musical talent. Agatha doesn't know where it is, but luckily for us in this video, I do. Back to the vault, though. In reality, as is the case with almost all vaults, it had a more sinister goal. The entire vault was subject to white noise generators that implemented subliminal messages to its population. And of course it all went badly wrong, with inhabitants 
inhabitants going insane and killing each other. Vault 92 is right near the upper northern centre of the map, right near the Deathclaw infested Old Olney area, so be careful when heading near the entrance, otherwise you could be greeted to a swift demise. There are no humans, at least living ones, to be found in the vault. Only Maya lurks in many different varieties, as well as bloatflies all over the place. And of course, a lot of angle deep water. Like many vaults in the game, Vault 92 can be a bit of a maze, especially if you want to explore all the different rooms and look into the history of what went on here. Something I recommend you do because it's hilarious in that dark humour kind of way that Fallout excels at. Otherwise, just follow the quest marker to the sound testing section of the vault where you can find a violin sitting on a table. Once you have that, all you need to do is go back to Agatha and hey presto, quest complete. You'll get some caps and some positive karma. But if you did explore and came across the sheet of music you can find in the vault, she'll also reward you the Black Hawk a unique scope 44 magnum that does more damage and is more accurate than the standard variant. You can also see Agatha playing the violin once you give it to her and she will also update your pit boy with the frequency for her radio channel which can be picked up anywhere in the capital wasteland. Sure there are two other buyers you can bring the violin to, but with all that misery and death out in the wastes, sometimes it's nice to help a little old lady out. And now we come to my number one pick, and boy oh boy is this a doozy of a quest, and I'm talking about the replicated man. Apologies if this entry is vague, but I'd rather people play this for themselves if they haven't, so I'll try and do my best not to show any spoilers. Anyway, the replicated man is probably the biggest quest in the game, and it also does something that did not become apparent until Fallout 4 came out, but we'll get to that. To start this quest, you need to go to Rivet Sitter, the half-sunken and broken aircraft carrier located at the bottom southeastern point on the map and once there head into the science lab and you'll be quickly accosted by Dr Zimmer, a cantankerous old man who is after something, probably the most unique thing you'll find in the capital wasteland, an android, only this android doesn't know he's an android as his memory has been wiped and he is now living with false memories believing he's as human as you or me, and Dr Zimmer wants this android back, you see Dr Zimmer has come all the way from the commonwealth, that's right, if you haven't played Fallout 3 but you have played Fallout 4, it's that Commonwealth. Dr. Zimmer is part of the Synth Retention Bureau. In fact, he's the leader of the Bureau for the Institute, which Zimmer will tell you anyway and is even name dropped in Fallout 4. But back to Fallout 3. After accepting the quest, you have to find the android. And to find the android, you need to find clues. And the clues are not so straightforward. You need to talk to a few different types of NPCs and you also need to find holotapes that will lead you to finding who this android is. But it's also not as simple as that. You see, just like the Stones of Baron Zaya in Skyrim, the holotapes are not marked on your map, and they are scattered all over the place. One easy way to find some of them is to listen carefully to Zimmer, and he'll give you a hint at where you should be looking. After you start asking questions around Rivet City and the wider wasteland, you'll eventually be approached by a woman called Victoria Watts, a member of the Railroad, an organisation dedicated to helping simps escape from under the thumb of the Institute. She wants you to tell Zimmer the android has been destroyed, and will even give you a piece of the android's body to prove it to to him. You can end the quest right here, but as should be apparent from this list, there are many different ways this quest can play out. Trying to locate all the clues can be a pain, and I would only recommend you do it if you want to hear everything that the android experiences, but a lot of people in the wasteland are members of the railroad. So why is this number one on my list? There are a few reasons. One, this quest covers a huge area of the wasteland when it comes to searching for the holotapes. Two, you have to speak to loads of different people, and the mystery of who the missing android is will keep you going. Three, it directly sets the groundwork for Fallout 4 with the Railroad, the Institute, Androids and the Commonwealth all being name dropped. 4. The four different outcomes are great in their own way and worth playing just to see the different character reactions and rewards. And 5. It raises a question you might not be thinking at first but will eventually seep its way into your head and it's this. We know there is at least one android that has had its memories wiped and believes it's human. So how do we know that there aren't more out there? Who else in the Capital Wasteland is an android under a new identity? And how many more are there to come? And for those of you who want want to know who the android is, well, you'll just have to play the game yourself. And those of you with any good camera in you, try not to spoil it for the newcomers, please. I'm his second in command. I run the night shift and he runs the day shift. And there we are, my top 5 quests in Fallout 3. Let me know if you agree with any of these or what you would consider your top 5 in the comments below. Let me know if you'd like to see a part 2 to this video as I could easily do another 2 videos on the base Fallout 3 quests alone. They are just that good. I've been Craig, this is Amalgam Ingle, and thanks for watching.
perilously 